Okay, g'day all and welcome to another video. So the topic of today is branchless programming. Yeah, we're gonna have a bit of a description of branchless programming and then we're gonna have a look at a couple of examples. So one really simple example and then after that something slightly more complicated. All right, so I will be putting up a companion ebook for the Patreons as well as the source code. So if you'd like to become a patron and support the channel, then jump over to Patreon. I'll put a link up above and another one down below and uh, cheers. Okay, branchless programming, branchless programming. What is branchless programming? Well, first of all, what is a branch? Uh, a branch in programming is uh, something like an if statement, the switch statement, uh, the conditional operator. A branch occurs whenever the CPU has more than one path that it can take. So usually the CPU just executes uh, one statement after another, but a branch occurs when there's a condition and the CPU could potentially take uh, one of two paths. So the reason that that's slow is because the CPU actually tries to stay ahead of where it's got to execute. So it tries to read uh, the upcoming instructions so that it can prepare them for when it's going to execute them. But the trouble is, if there's a branch, uh, the CPU doesn't necessarily know which path it's going to take. So it doesn't know which instructions to load. And what it does is it guesses. It guesses which path to load and it loads a bunch of instructions, which might be good. That might be the instructions that it needs to execute. But on the other hand, it might actually be the wrong instructions. <laughs> it'll have to flush all of those instructions out and it'll have to read the real path. That flushing of the wrong path and the loading of the real path actually takes a lot of time, so it's really, really slow. And in branchless programming, what we're trying to do is, uh, is minimize or reduce the number of branches. So we want to get rid of things like if statements in the middle of our loops. And uh, yeah, hopefully the CPU will run our code much faster since it doesn't have to flush when it reads the wrong path. Okay, so that's the basics of a branch, but let's have a look at a bit of an example just here. So here I've got uh, the first example. This is really, really simple stuff, but we will get into more sophisticated stuff and uh, eventually jump into assembly. But right here we've got a small function. It's just called smaller and it takes two integer parameters, a and b, and it returns the smaller of the two. So this is a pretty logical way to code it just here. We'd just say something like, uh, if a is smaller than b, then return a, else return b. Whenever we call this function, if a and b are sort of randomly distributed, then you could expect that 50% of the time, um, this function will return a, and 50% of the time, this function will return b. The CPU doesn't actually know, without performing the comparison, which one it's gonna return. Okay, so that's actually branching code. That's perfectly normal C++ code. That's a natural way to code. And honestly, it's a fairly good way to code. So particularly for this function, this is a very small, simple function. And as we'll see in just a minute, um, when we disassemble this thing, uh, the compiler actually knows exactly what we're doing. Uh, all right, but this is second example just here is an effort to make that branchless. So this is just a little introduction to the concepts. This is not a good way to go for this uh, particular example, but let's just have a bit of a look at it. So we've got here smaller branchless. It takes two parameters, uh, A and B, and it returns an int just the same as before, but the expression that it returns doesn't have an if statement in it at all. We say um, return a multiplied by a smaller than b plus b multiplied by b smaller than or equal to a. Uh, that, my friends, is a branchless smaller function. So this actually shows a really common technique in branchless programming and that is uh, arithmetic using the conditional operators. So the conditional operators just here, this less than just here, and the same with this less than or equal to over here, uh, they actually return one when the condition is true and zero when it's false. So they do actually return uh, numerical values and we can do arithmetic on that. So this expression just here, uh, if a happens to be smaller than b, then this little return statement just here will become return a times one plus b times zero. And if b happens to be the smaller of the two, or if they're both equal, then we'll get something like return a times zero plus b times one. Yeah, you see, because the conditional operators just return one for true and zero for false. Uh, so you can actually string together a whole bunch of these uh, additions and multiplications. You just have to do something like this pattern just here. We've got a times the comparison that leads to a being returned plus B times the comparison that leads to B being returned, plus C times the comparison that uh, leads to C being returned. So you can actually make um, you know, a whole string of these things together. You can do more than um, just two options. So in this particular example, uh, this is actually gonna be much, much slower. So let's have a bit of a look at why that might be. Modern compilers are actually pretty good at uh, optimizing and they know a whole bunch of optimization tricks, including branchless programming. Okay, so the uh, compiler actually 
actually saw what we were trying to do in the first example and it said well you're just trying to return the smallest int and uh, I know a branchless way to do that. So the compiler optimized the branch out completely and it led to something like this uh, assembly code down here. So this is the assembly code from the first uh, example. We've got uh, mov ebx d word pointer b so just move b into the register ebx then compare that value with the a and c mov l c mov l conditionally move l yeah move a into ebx if uh, if it's less so the branch just here has been replaced by this uh, instruction c mov l so the c++ compiler has actually recognized what we're trying to do it's made a branchless version using um, a really good instruction for this particular um code. If we have a look at the second example, so the second example I was trying to be tricky, I was trying to be clever, I was trying to outthink the compiler and I put in a branchless code myself, uh, hoping that it would go faster, but it didn't. So if we have a look at the disassembly of the second version, we see that things are a lot more complicated. So remembering that the first listing uh, up above was really, really fast. It was like three instructions, but this one here is much, much longer. So this is actually branchless as well. So you'll see in here, there's uh, this one here, set LE. So that's actually a branchless condition there as well. Uh, set LE is gonna set the byte to one, if some condition less or equal in this particular instance, it's gonna set BL to one if that's true and it's gonna set it to zero if that's false. Yeah, so then it performs the IMULs, another set L down here, another IMUL, add the results together. So you'll see looking at that code there that that's more or less uh, a word for word assembly translation of the original C++. Uh, the compiler wasn't able to see what we were trying to do. It didn't recognize the pattern that we were trying to uh, achieve here. So in this particular example, our branchless code is much, much slower. And often uh, it really pays to have a bit of a look at the disassembly and see what the compiler is doing with your code. Uh, just so that you can get a bit of an idea if the uh, compiler is actually doing things well uh, or if it's just going to be really, really slow. Branchless programming is not always beneficial, especially in circumstances where the compiler is uh, able to optimize the code itself. It's able to realize what we're trying to do and uh, outcode us. Yeah, so you do have to be careful where you apply this sort of stuff. Okay, moving on to the second example. So this one I think is slightly more interesting than the first, only slightly, mind you. <laughs> um, all right, let us now consider a more complex example. We want to write a function that takes a string of ASCII characters and converts all the lowercase letters to uppercase. Yeah, so we're writing a to upper method, in other words. Uh, you don't want to convert uppercase letters, obviously they're already uppercase, and you also don't want to convert uh, bytes that happen to be things like numbers or punctuation marks. Uh, okay, so it might help to mention that the uh, ASCII uh, numbers or codes are actually made so that the lowercase versions of letters are 32 above the uppercase versions. Yeah, so the uppercase letters have codes from 65 to 90, with 65 being a capital A, and the lowercase versions of the letters are from 97 to 122. So 65 is an uppercase A and 97 is a lowercase A. Uh, which means that all you got to do to convert is, uh, first of all, make sure that it is within the range of 97 to 122. Uh, but if it is in that range, then subtract 20, uh, 32 from it. Yeah, and you'll have a lowercase version. Uh, okay, so a little bit about the timings here. I've actually run these two upper functions a million times with strings of 1,024 characters. So there's going to be minimal cache misses, and we're really getting the um, best possible circumstance here. In practice, this is probably not going to work uh, as fast as it does in this uh, benchmark. Okay, but let's have a look at the first example. So the first example is just your basic C++ code, i equals zero all the way up to count. And all we say is uh, if di is greater than or equal to lowercase a, and if di is less than or equal to lowercase z, then subtract 32 from di. Alrighty, so that's our C++ function. Let's disassemble that bad boy and see what the uh, compiler come up with. Would you look at that? Uh, okay, so you don't have to look at this very long to see that there are a bunch of instructions called J-A, J -A, jump if above. My friends, those are branches. Yeah, those are conditional branches. Jump if above is a conditional branch and that is what we're trying to get rid of. And what I found when I ran this uh, a million times was that this code takes something like 3.33 uh, seconds to complete our little benchmark of a million iterations there. So what we're gonna do is have a bit of a look at some branchless techniques and see if we can improve that.
Alrighty, so here's my first branchless version just here. This code here is completely branchless, nary a branch in sight. So let's, let's break it down a little bit. So it's in two halves. If D is greater than or equal to A and D is less than or equal to Z, it's gonna give us one if DI is a lowercase letter and it's gonna give us zero if it's not. And then we've flipped that with a little not just here and I'm multiplying that by DI. Yeah, so that'll actually maintain all of the uppercase letters or the punctuation marks or the numbers or that sort of thing. And the second part down here is the lowercase part. Yeah, so instead of DI equaling itself multiplied by, you know, that expression, we've got DI minus 32 multiplied by, yeah, the same expression. So DI is greater than or equal to A and DI is less than or equal to Z. Yeah, so we just compute the expression these are brackets just here and there's an imaginary expression, right? <laughs> and uh, multiply by the uh, value that we want. And if we run this code here on my particular little machine, it actually comes out to around about three times faster than the original two upper. So that's a pretty good speed gain. Um, we go from about three and a third seconds down to about one second. Yeah, so that's a nice gain, but let's have a bit of a look at how we can improve things more. So in the second version just here, two upper branchless, we've got uh, di minus equals. 32 times that expression just there. Yeah, so once again, that expression is gonna come out as zero if di is not a lowercase letter, and it's gonna come out as one if it is a lowercase letter, then we're multiplying that by 32 and subtracting it from uh, di. So this is actually much faster than our first branchless programming version. I think this is something like six or seven times faster than the original C++, and the running time there that I got on my particular machine just here was uh, about 471 milliseconds. Yeah, so we're down to less than half a second now. Uh, so seven times speed gain on a two upper, that's not bad really. Yeah, the code is a little bit tricky to read, but we're gonna get a whole lot more tricky to read, so let's just buckle those seatbelts. All right, but that's all C++, so now we're gonna jump over to assembly and have a look at some similar things in assembly and see just how much speed we can get. Uh, okay, so the first assembly version just here is not uh, branchless. This is branching code, perfectly normal branching code. We've got uh, two upper ASM1 just here. JG is a branch, JL is a branch, and also the bottom of the loop is a branch too, J, N, Z, but often you can't get rid of all the branches. You know, you'll have to have a bottom of your loop at some point, or not, just <laughs> have all of your code written in RAM one after another. Okay, so that's just a simple branching version in assembly. Uh, so the runtime there is, is not great. So the speed of that one there is about 3.6 seconds. So that's actually slower than the original C++, which is about three and a third seconds. So it just goes to show that you don't, uh, you don't automatically get speed from jumping over to assembly. You have to code it well. Uh, let's have a look at a second example. So this is branchless assembly. Right here, we're gonna use the CMOVs, the conditional moves, because we're great and we know how to do it. All right, so once again, we read a byte from uh, RCX. We store it in AL just here, AL Demiola. Uh, then we MOV negative one into R8D. Now negative one is 32 ones all in a line. Uh, and we zero R9D. So I could have XOR just there, XOR R9D, R9D, but I wasn't feeling cool. I was feeling like, I don't know, old school. So I just, anyway, comp al z. All right. So if um, al is greater than z, then this line just here, c mob g, or conditionally move on greater than condition, is going to move r9d, which is zero, into r8d, which at the moment has negative one. So this will actually clear r8d if x is greater than z. Yeah, so we're just making a bit of a bit mask here with the RAD, fill it up with ones and then uh, zero it if uh, AL is outside the range of the lowercase letters. Yeah, that's pretty much all we're doing. Okay, so this version just here is branchless and it runs in about 1.477 milliseconds. Yeah, which is not too bad, really. Yeah, not too bad, but it's not as fast as our branchless versions in C++ that we saw at the very start. I mean, branchless programming is a SIMD technique, isn't it, really? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm just yanking your chain here, people. Let's, let's do this for real, shall we? So branchless programming and SIMD go hand in hand. Uh, SIMD, branchless programming, is really how you put the uh, pedal to the metal. Uh, okay, so SIMD, single instruction, multiple data. You could do this in C++ using the intrinsics. This CPU and a whole bunch of them out there in the, in the wild world actually have something called AVX in them, advanced vector extensions. And these can actually do 32 byte operations at once. Yeah, so we might as well use the uh, AVX registers and see if we can get a little bit of extra speed. So this 
Final version just here is an AVX branchless version of our little two upper function. All right, push RBX, save the call as RBX. RBX is not scratch, people, we gotta save it. Okay, so a lot of this stuff at the top is just to figure out if there's residuals. Our AVX deals with 32 bytes at once, and if the count isn't actually divisible by 32 bytes, then we might have some extra at the end. Uh, Vcomp, equal B. Okay, so that's a SEMD way to set one of the AVX registers, YMM3, just here, to all ones across the entire register. Now, if you ever got to uh, ones complement uh, things in AVX, then you can just XOR with another register that is filled with uh, ones. All right, then we read a bunch of little constants just here. 32, GT equal A array and Z array. Those are just defined at the very top of the file. 32 is just a whole bunch of 32s. GT equal A array is actually filled with A minus one. And the Z array is filled with Zs. So those are just for performing our comparisons. But let's have a look at how the main SIMD loop works. So we read 32 bytes into YMM5. So all of this business just here is all about figuring out whether or not we've got bytes that are within the range of lowercase letters. Yeah, we've got to get a mask, a bit mask, so that we want uh, ones for all of the letters that are lowercase and uh, zeros for all of the letters that are uppercase. All right, then we copy the original characters over to uh, YMM4 so that at the moment they're just in uh, YMM5. Yeah, we want to complement the mask that we made just before so that instead of having all of the letters that are lowercase, we've got another mask, which is all of the letters that are not lowercase. Yeah, that's why we set up that YMM3 with all ones before. Um, we and that not lowercase mask with YMM5. So YMM5 was actually the data that we read from the array and anding that with the uh, not lowercase mask will result in all of the letters that were not lowercase, so the uppercase letters and the digits or punctuation, uh, they're all gonna stay exactly the same, but any of the characters that were lowercase will actually be zeroed. Yeah, they'll become nothing. And the next thing that we've gotta do is uh, subtract 32 from the uh, other values. These are the values that are gonna become the lowercase uh, converted to uppercase. Yeah, so subtract 32 from those values uh, and that with the lowercase mask. So this is the other mask that we made. And what we'll end up with there is um, zero for all of the values that were not lowercase and we'll end up with um, uppercase versions of all of the values that were lowercase. Yeah, and then finally we can all our two results together. So that's the two results from our masks and store. Everything after that is just uh, dealing with residuals. Yeah, so the residual loop just here just deals with things uh, in scalar, one at a time. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the important thing about this code and the reason why you might want to write this really stupid code, the reason why we would do something like uh, branchless SIMD is this code actually runs at somewhere between, say, 25 and 40 times faster than the original C++. So that's really, really worth doing. And I will say that I've actually had a lot of trouble timing this code, it tends to pretty much take no time at all, and the time to randomize the data takes longer than the time to send it to upper. Now, if you do time this at home, you'll find just wild times. It'll report 100 times faster, 200 times faster. Yeah, I don't think it's anything like that, but um, it is much, much faster than the C++. It's fairly generic. So in this particular example, we're converting to uppercase. But really, all we're doing here is an algorithm where we're conditionally subtracting uh, some value from uh, bytes if they're within a range. Yeah, so this is really quite flexible. You could use this for a lot of different things. I mean, you wouldn't have to subtract, you could add or, or, or whatever sort of operation you wanna do, but conditionally perform some operation on bytes if they're within some range. Okay, so the conclusion. Uh, branches are slow. Yeah, try to uh, improve your code by using branchless techniques. Uh, this works in high level languages. It even works in C Sharp, Java, those sorts of things. Yeah, you'll find that the compiler often knows a bunch of branchless techniques. And uh, if you disassemble your compiled code, sometimes you get a better idea of uh, exactly what the compiler is doing. Uh, it's really worth looking into. Uh, branchless techniques are not always gonna help, but they're really, really interesting. It's just one of those techniques that I think uh, is, is, is largely lost in uh, today's programming uh, education fields. Uh, I was never taught this. I was never taught this. I just had to study it from uh, various sources online, your Wikipedia and, and, and things like that, uh, performance manuals and things like that from, uh, from AMD, Intel. Yeah, but uh, it does make for a really, really interesting study and really good fun trying to uh, outcode the compiler with your branchless techniques. Anyway, as I said, I'll be putting up a companion ebook for this video up on uh, Patreon, and you can also get the source code on Patreon. Other than that, I wanna say thank you very much. Happy branchless coding, people. Have a good one.